All right, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, we're going to go to several places here. The first hand to go to 1 Corinthians 15. Second hand to go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. And the other one is Luke 24. Luke 24. So again, they are Luke 24, Genesis 2, and 1 Corinthians 15. So again, Luke 24, Genesis 2, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Tonight I'll be teaching to you about blood of God and devils. Blood of God and devils. So we're going to go through some of the teachings that some of you Bible believers may have, may have heard from other Bible-believing preachers, but uh, it wasn't made that clear. It wasn't explained as much. So some of those stuff I want to get into and study for myself. Like Dr. Ruckman, once he teaches something, it just goes over your head like 100 miles per hour, right? So there were a few stuff that he taught that I was like, man, Lord, I need to put it on a shelf and to study it for myself. So some of the stuff that he taught when I got into it, I was like, man, the Lord truly blessed him with a lot of knowledge and wisdom. He, I mean, the man was all the way like many, many years ago, like half a, uh, half a century ago, and he was teaching all of this stuff. So it's amazing. And you got to realize he didn't have technology like we did. And then, you know, doing a simple search work. All right, so let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First of all, you have to understand that heavenly incorruptible bodies do not have blood. Heavenly incorruptible bodies do not have blood. The Bible says, now at verse 50, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Look at this, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So corruption is tied to flesh and blood, and flesh and blood is not allowed at the third heaven. It is not allowed. So incorruptible bodies, that means they do not have blood. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2. Notice what God said about Adam. So Adam, obviously, he was not corrupted yet at that time of Genesis chapter 2. So he was not corrupt at that time. Now notice his wording on what he said to Eve. He did not say the usual phrase that is, apply to corruptible humans. Remember, 1 Corinthians 15 says what? Flesh and blood, right? That's a phrase, if you look up throughout your whole Bible, that's referring to current state of humanity, flesh and blood. Just look up that phrase all over the Bible. It's referring to the current state of corruptible humanity. But notice Adam, he didn't call himself flesh and blood. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, and you'll notice at verse... 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So notice that Adam said about Eve, that both of them, it's flesh and bones, not flesh and blood. Look at that same phrase at Luke 24 now, Luke chapter 24. If you don't have time to turn to these verses, simply write them down, simply write them down, and then you can check it up later in your spare time. You can just simply hear the verses. If that will help you a lot. Luke chapter 24 and verse 39. The Bible reads here. Jesus says. Now remember Jesus is in his incorruptible body. Like we Christians are going to have as well. Jesus in his incorruptible body. Look what he says in Luke 24 39. Behold my hands and my feet. That it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not what? Flesh and bones as he see me have. Jesus did not call himself flesh and blood. As a matter of fact, if you look up throughout your Bible, the Bible will talk about that Jesus, he did come in flesh and blood, that exact phrase. But here he doesn't say that now. He says flesh and bones. Why? Because in 1 Corinthians 15 is true, incorruptible bodies, bodies that are not corrupted, have no blood in them. Now let's look at uh, John chapter 3, verse 5. John chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 5. This is fascinating when you look at your scriptures. Amen. Look what the Apostle John says at John chapter 3, and then your second hand to go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. 
Again, the two passages are John chapter 3 and 1 John chapter 5. Let's make this simple. In our bodies, we know that we must have blood. So a typical human body must have blood. But also, it must have water. That's a no-brainer. So a typical body, human body, must have it must have blood and it must have water. So we can agree with that so far, right? So let's keep it simple. When you keep things simple in the scripture and take the words exactly as it says, then the complicated, deeper stuff becomes even more enlightening. So make sure that you always start with simple, read the words as it says, and please do not compare with Greek Hebrew lexicons and your NIV and your ESV and whatever KJV 2021 version that they might come out, the coronavirus version or whatever yeah. Bible that's going to come out. You don't want to, that messes up the word. The yeah. word of God itself is where we establish doctrine. So it is important to understand that. Look what Jesus says in John chapter 3 verse 5. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus says that a man has to have one birth, which is born of water, right. and then the second birth, which is a spiritual birth. Why? That, what is he talking about? He's talking about born of water, fleshly birth, second birth, spiritual birth. Does the scripture say that? Yeah, look at verse 6. That which is born of the what? Flesh is flesh, there's your water. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. There's your second birth, the spiritual birth. So we can establish for a fact that a human body must have blood and water. Now check this out, 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5. Now I remember Dr. Upman, he would use this passage several times for one of his quote-unquote crazy teachings. A lot of critics would say, see, this man was batty, he was crazy, he was nuts. But then when you just reread that scripture over and over and over again, take every word and just take it slowly. Don't just skim through it. Just right. take it slowly, read every word. Then you realize, oh, I see where he's getting this from. So then look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. This is he, Jesus Christ, that came by what? Water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit, it is truth. So this is talking about Jesus Christ when he came down. He came down as a human. So when he came down as a human, he came by water and blood. We can all agree with that so far, right? All right, so we can all agree so far that Jesus Christ, when he came down in his humanity, he came down with water and blood. Now, remember this, when Jesus raised himself from the dead through his uh, resurrection. He, in his body, his body has blood and water. Remember that when he came down his humanity state, it had blood and water. But when he resurrected, what was missing? The blood. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So if the blood is missing, what's remaining then? The water. The water. So then, in his incorruptible body, he had a water circulatory system that you thought that the old man was batty about. Because why? Because the body must have blood and water. It must have that. Yeah. But an incorruptible body cannot have blood. So then that leaves the option with the water. Did you... The Bible says at verse 6, he has to have water and blood when he came down here. So if you take out the blood, then that means he has that water. He has a water state. But here's something else that's even more interesting. Look at the wording here. Why did John say, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Look at this. Not by water only, but by water and blood. Why did the Apostle John write it that way? That's good. He's... He's pointing out something significant here. He's thinking, uh, because remember, he's talking about Jesus Christ transforming himself, coming down in human flesh, right? So then when he's coming down in human flesh, he's talking about over here that Jesus Christ, not by water only. Meaning that it's obvious that Jesus' body to have water, but it was considered strange that he would have water and blood. Why? 
because heavenly bodies, it would make a lot more sense if heavenly bodies did not have blood. That's the thing. So that's why John mentioned, like, not by water only. When Jesus came down, it was water and blood. But let me show you even a more enlightening one. John chapter, did you read John chapter 3, verse 5 through 6? Jesus says, now, if you don't believe me, read that verse again. To enter into the kingdom of God, it's not just the spiritual birth. It's not by spirit. It's by also what? Water. Water to enter into the kingdom of God. How about that? Wow. There's something to it here then. There's something to it here. Now, think about this. Now we can start connecting the dots to where some Bible-believing preachers got deeper and deeper. Think about this now. So then, if that's the case, that incorruptible bodies do not have blood, but that it becomes something like it's common that there would be water up there, the incorruptible bodies, that they would have a water circulatory system up there, then that means in the beginning dispensation, in the beginning dispensation over here, that when we're talking about the bodies, it was a pure water system, so to speak. Now, let's keep reading over here. If we think about that case, then remember about Adam here? Adam, he had no blood as well. Remember that? before He, he had a body that's not corrupted flesh and blood. So he was flesh and bones. Adam's body is described similarly as Jesus' incorruptible body. Remember those two verses? Genesis 2, Luke 24. Both of them said flesh and bones. Right. So they had a similar type of body. Then that means his body had water too. So if we take that into account then, that his body also had water too, Oh, the old man was by a baddie saying that Adam had a water circulatory system. You just don't take time reading that book. If you take time reading that book, then some Bible-believing preachers, yeah, they may go senile on you, you might think, and 50 years later and all that, but man, as the, as the Word of God says, gray hairs, there is wisdom. And you want to get counsel not from the younger people, like one, uh, like one Jewish king made the mistake. You had to get it from the elderly. Why? Because these old people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Little. Now, let's keep reading over here. If we take into account that Adam's body before corruption, remember that? If it's not a corruptible body, that's the basis. Remember that? So then if it's not corrupted, then he had the water circulatory system. If it's corrupted, then he would have what? He would have blood and water, right? So then if it's corrupted, he would have blood and water. Then we know when he got the blood then. When he got the blood was when he took, was when he what? When he corrupted himself simply. Yeah, right. When was the act of corruption? When he partook the fruit at the Garden of Eden. When he partook the fruit at the Garden of Eden, that's when he became corrupt. Now it gets even, see, you're, if you're building up something simple and then building up logic one, two, three, then everything starts to click. Now let's get deeper then. Then it starts to make sense, okay, if he got the blood, if Adam got that blood once he uh, took the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's where he got that blood from that fruit over there. Think about it. Then you can figure out the identity of the fruit right, at the on. Garden of Eden. That's Which great. fruit in the Bible mentions that it has blood? Which fruit in the Bible has the word blood in it? And another thing, here's another one. Think of the best candidate uh, the best fruit candidate that it would connect to sin every time the bible mentions about this fruit a lot of times it will connect it to sin and guess what it's not an apple 
If you look at Deuteronomy 32.10, go to Deuteronomy 32.10. Look up every time the Bible says apple, it's a positive sense. It's not something sinful. Every time the Bible says apple, it's in a positive sense. It's not a sinful thing. But if you look up grape, a lot of times when you look up the word grape, where it becomes fermented wine, that's where the Bible mentions a lot about sin connected to it. And not only that, the Bible also says the blood of grapes. So that's why, oh, maybe he's not really a little batty after all. So maybe he has some sense here. So then that's why at the Garden of Eden, the fruit was grapes. Then this starts to make sense over here. Then it starts to make sense why Jesus Christ, when he had to save them from Adam's sinful state, he likened it to John chapter 6 about drinking his blood, and it's symbolized through fresh grape juice. You ever thought about that? Why would Jesus Christ choose that then? See, once you start to uh, acknowledge and understand this part of the deep doctrine, everything else will start to click after that. It'll start to click and become enlightening to you. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and then we'll read verse 10. The Bible reads about an apple that it's in a positive sense. What does God say about it? It's his fruit. He found him in a desert land, verse 10. And in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. See, that's God's fruit. Now look at Ezekiel 31, though. Look at Ezekiel 31. Amen. Ezekiel 31. So let's look at this passage here. You know what Satan is likened unto? I don't know if you knew this. The devil is likened unto that sinful tree at Eden. Did you know that? The devil is likened to that sinful tree at the Garden of Eden. So look at the book of Ezekiel and notice what the Bible reads concerning about that wicked one. He is likened to this sinful tree at the Garden of Eden. Ezekiel chapter 31, we'll read verse 7. Thus was he fair in his greatness, and the length of his branches for his root was by great waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto his beauty. Uh, remember Ezekiel 28? The Eden, the deck, the gold and the jewelry of all Eden, that's Lucifer, the anointed cherub. See, this all matches with undoubtedly with Lucifer. Uh, read verse 9. The Bible says, I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all, look at this, the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. It's talking about this particular tree at the garden of Eden. That was beautiful than all the other trees at the garden of Eden. No wonder he was looking. Right. She was looking. Right. Now let's keep reading. Verse 16 through 17. Look at this, the language here. This matches with Isaiah 14 about Lucifer falling down, his fall, and hell created for him. Verse 16, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. All right, so we can see clearly that this language and wording undoubtedly fits the devil, especially when you look at the wording of Satan at Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. So in this passage, Satan possessed Pharaoh, and he's likened to, a, to the sinful tree at Eden. Wait a minute, then look at Ephesians 2. This starts to make sense. Look at Ephesians 2.2. 2. That's why Jesus... He has to buy us from the children of the devil into becoming his children. Why? Because when we partook of that fruit from the tree, which is typified by Satan, 
What we're actually intaking spiritually is becoming the family of the devil that time. And ever since that time, spiritually mankind was a child of the devil. Their blood lineage is connected to that one. Right. When Adam partook of that fruit, I mean, not only did he receive that blood from that, but spiritually he became a child of the devil as well as everybody, which is why God had to redeem mankind and give throughout many different dispensations ways of how they can get saved. Right. Now let's keep reading here. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the who, what were they before they got saved? The children of disobedience. Let's also look at, well, here, we're not going to turn to these passages for time's sake, but uh, we notice later on that Satan, he tried to corrupt blood ever since the beginning. Now, once he did this at the Garden of Eden, he did not stop over there. What did he do? He tried to contaminate it physically through Genesis chapter 6. Those sons of God intermingling with mankind. He tried to corrupt innocent blood again. Remember, Adam and Eve, they were at the stage of innocence, right? Satan likes it when blood can corrupt the innocent. So he did it again with Cain. He shed innocent blood. You wonder why the Bible calls murder shedding innocent blood. How about that? So Satan, he likes to do that. The key is this. Satan, what he wants to do is corrupt something innocent. And he knew that with corruptible blood, he can use that so much to his advantage where he can glorify sin or something of his own domain and his own glory. That's why Satan worshipers and Satanism, occult, they all make a big deal about blood, 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 blood. And in the eyes of God, that's blasphemy. There are so many times we see how Satan tried to corrupt innocent blood. First one is Genesis chapter. Uh, so you can write these verses down. Uh, I'll repeat it twice, but I'm going to go in a little bit of fast pace. Here's a list of so many times how Satan tried to corrupt innocent blood. Genesis chapter 6 verse 2 and verses 4 through 5. Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, and verses 4 through 5. He tried to corrupt the blood physically through fallen angels. Chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. Chapter 4, verses 9 to, through 10. He corrupted innocent blood through Cain when he murdered Abel. He tried to corrupt innocent blood. Psalms chapter 106, verse 38. Psalms chapter 106, verse 38. Through human and children sacrifice. The Bible says that when they were sacrificed their children unto devils, the book of Psalms read, reads the land was polluted with blood. That's how the Bible, that's how God took special notice of that. There's something about blood, see, that God takes a huge importance in, and that is a matter of fact, no matter how, uh, no matter all the other stuff that you may have heard tonight, one thing we can all agree with is God takes a significant look and a deeper meaning with blood. There's no doubt about that. He makes a big deal about that. And Satan makes a big deal out of that too. So he tries to corrupt it. Another example, Psalms chapter 16, verse 4. Psalms chapter 16, verse 4. Drinking blood rituals. Drinking blood rituals. That's why the devil gets them involved. That's why God says, don't eat blood at the book of Leviticus. Amen. There are something those pagans were doing at the book of Psalm 16. Here's an interesting one. You never thought of this before. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 31. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 31. How about corrupting the first innocent state of grape blood and corrupting it where you can turn it into a fermented, corrupted state of alcohol? You ever thought about that? Wow. All right, here's another one. You, you ever thought about this before? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. Satan tried to corrupt the innocent, perfected blood of Jesus Christ through a what? A perpetual, powerless, quote-unquote, imperfect, sacrifice Roman Catholic Mass. Mm. See, Satan wants to disgrace blood all the time. Yeah. Something pure and innocent of blood, Satan wants to keep corrupting that. Right. So that will be Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, where we know that Christ... He perfected it with his blood and that he sacrificed once 
and that it wasn't consistent like the Catholic Mass does. Now, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19. Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll read verse 19. Now let's look at, throughout the different dispensations, how blood was carried. We see at the beginning, purely water state. During Adam's state, it was a water state, but then later on in the midst of this, as it was moving toward a different timeline, the first half was water, second half became water and blood. And then now after that, it became blood over here. All right? Now let's see how God moved throughout the different dispensations in this manner. The Old Testament, they were in trouble. So, because they were incorruptible blood of sin. And God, he could not accept human sacrifice. Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it's a disgrace to him. So he wants innocent animals. That's what he wanted to cover up their sin, their corrupted state. So we look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19. The word of God reads over here. Uh, my finger. Let me turn it over. For when Moses has spoken every precept to all the people according to the law. Now look how God made a big deal about this to cover their corrupted state. He took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law, the Old Testament law, purged with blood. Without shedding of blood is no remission, no forgiveness. See? So at this point over here, it was the blood of animals that time. But it could not take away their sins. Why? Because it's not perfect blood. It's not perfect blood. So God, he can only count it where it was innocent. And th that's why Old Testament salvation is different. They can't just go up to heaven because they're not in a perfect estate bought by the perfect blood of Christ. They had to go somewhere else. And that's a totally different teaching. But they went to the underworld, Abraham's bosom. And they had to wait. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. Notice the blood of the lambs cannot take away their sins, even though it forgave them. Even the Lord counted it as forgiven. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. How about that? So then what happened during the church age here? What happened during the church age here? Let's look what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did. And this is where you shout, bless God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. Jesus Christ, when he came down, shed his precious and most holy blood, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. Yeah. And then because of that, it was once and for all. Let's look at some of the passages over here. Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll read verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves. See that? They can't take away the sins. But by his own blood, yep. he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So that's Hebrews 9, 12. I'm supposed to read Hebrews 10, 12, excuse me. That works too, right? That works too. The King James Bible is amazing. That's why we believe those verse numbers are inspired too. So... <laughs> Joking aside, let's look at Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, comma, not like the Catholic Bible, right? Yeah, yeah. Sat down on the right hand of God. So it was perfected once and for all. That's why there's no doubt salvation of Old Testament saints was definitely different from the salvation of church-age Christians. The Old Testament saints, they had to sacrifice animals in the New Testament the church age, they put their faith and trust in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and their works of the law. They didn't have to do that. Remember the Jews, because this blood is insufficient, they had to do what? This too. And whenever they failed in this, the works of the law, they what? They used this, the blood, to give them a clear slate. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Here's something interesting then if this blood is perfect, that means this blood is different. Listen up now. This blood is different and special from Adam. That's important to understand. 
It is true the Bible will say Jesus came down in flesh and blood, that exact phrase, like mankind. But remember this, he's not just fully 100% man, he's also what? 100% God. And you got to realize that within that human transaction when he was born, the Holy Spirit was in there who conceived Jesus Christ. So let's look at the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. So look how special this blood is. And almost all things are by the law perched with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now pay attention. Where did this blood go then? Where did this blood go? Where is the blood of Jesus? John MacArthur thinks that it was an ordinary blood, nothing too special about it. He thinks only the act of Calvary is the one that counts for your salvation, not the blood. Well, you might as well just chop off hundreds of hymns that talk about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at this one. Notice that this blood is not just ordinary blood and it just rotted on the ground and it disappeared. Poof, this is something special. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, the blood. So remember, the tabernacle was supposed to represent a pattern of the heavens, the universe. Right. So th the blood of the animals was supposed to purify the tabernacle, which represents the pattern of the heavens. Well, more so with the genuine article then. The genuine, the blood represents, uh, the blood of the lamb represents the blood of Jesus Christ. The tabernacle represents the universe. Now look at this then. So that means the blood of Jesus, uh, the blood of the lambs, when they cleanse all that tabernacle, which is the pattern of the universe, then that represents what? The blood of Jesus Christ cleansing up the whole heavens and universe itself. It's around there. Look at this. Keep reading. But the heavenly thing, see that? That's the real uh, universe out there. With what? Better sacrifices than these. That's Jesus Christ's sacrifice at verse 24. How about that? That's where the blood is. Oh, then it starts to make sense when you think about 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and 9, that the blood of Jesus Christ, present tense, cleanseth us from all sins. Why? It couldn't just be at the past and rot on the ground, poop, disappear. Right. It had, the Bible says the blood is still there yep. to clean you. Well, where can it be then? If 1 John 1, 7 says that the blood is presently, presently able to cleanse you of your sins, where is it? Hebrews 9 told you. It's throughout the universe itself. It's all throughout the universe. That's why verse 9 says, whenever you sin, you can confess your sin and the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse it. That's why we are not hyper-dispensationalists. We are not mid-acts, uh, grace type of churches where they deny about confessing of sins, that it's unnecessary. No, I believe it's necessary that I have the power to do that because that blood is throughout the universe and the precious blood of my Savior, I got the power to claim it and use it when I confess my sins under the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and I need no priest to tell me what to do about that. So those hyper dispensationalists, they rob you of your power being overtly obsessed with Paul. Now, we are dispensationalists. We know that Paul, he was the one that mentioned about the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. We believe dispensational salvations. But for crying out loud, these hyper-dispensationalists are overtly obsessed with Paul that you're stuck with only 12 epistles as your only Bible. When all the other Bibles, you got to look at that there are doctrines and scriptural passages that can apply to you. Not all verses, obviously, in the general epistles or in the Old Testament apply to you. They're for different people. But some of those verses, they do apply to you. Some of them do. Didn't you know there's church age doctrine that you can find? Church age doctrine that you will find at the book of Psalms, for example, or other places that you can find. What are you going to do at the book of James then if you apply that to only tribulation doctrine? You lose one of your five crowns then. You get four. <laughs> Go back. All right, let's leave those hypers alone. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20.
The reason why I kick hyper dispensationalists or the mid ax group is because people automatically think that because we teach dispensationalism, that when other teachers they find online teaching dispensationalism, they think we're all in the same boat. No, the devil can do that too. Mm -hmm. That's why the Bible warns you to rightly divide the word of yeah. truth, not right. just divide. Right. It says rightly divide. Satan can divide too, but he wrongly divides. Got to watch out for that. Like Colossians chapter 1 verse 20, notice that that's why it makes sense that the blood is throughout all the universe. Look how it makes sense at verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile, look at this, all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. That makes sense then. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll read verse 50. Then what happens to the church? Bless God, some of those post-trippers are going to get a heart attack. But what's going to happen is, then the church, say by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, before, you see this? You see this picture? Tribulation, church. Notice that I'm not drawing a line straight through here. I'm drawing a line straight up here. Oh, yeah. This is what happens, and anti-dispensationalist people who are post-trib, etc., get a heart attack when they see this. <laughs> but this is important because if you believe in this doctrine, then it's going to make sense all the other stuff when it talks about the blood. What happens to the church? We're saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we leave our corruptible blood behind. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Now this I say then, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So God says flesh and blood can't go up there. But look at this. This is corruption inherit incorruption. So God's mentioning a change here. Yeah. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed. Change in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, where the trumpet shall sound. And the dead shall be raised, what? Incorruptible, and we shall be what? Changed. Look at that. Now it starts to make sense. When you got the blood, mankind became corrupted over here. 1 Corinthians 15 says corruption cannot go up there. That, why? Because it's tied to blood. So blood has to be left behind. And that's why the Bible also says we're changed when we go up there. There's a transformation. This transformation, part of it is what? Your corrupted blood left behind. Your corrupted blood left behind. And if you don't think that your blood is corrupted, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know science. You don't know medicine. And you got to realize that we, yeah, within, even in our blood, you're not really that healthy. Amen. Now you go home and pray about that for a while. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Now let's cover something really deep here. We're going to cover probably the deepest portion here. Look at 1 John chapter 5. Let's look how it ties to the Trinity. Let's see how it ties to the Trinity. Now this will be very interesting. And me, I'm not going to claim this as doctrine, so I want you to all understand and give me grace. Everyone has their own little theories, right? Amen. So, And I could be wrong with my theories too, bless God. So uh, I'm going to say that, but I want us to study the scriptures and see something here. There seems to be a connection. First of all, 1 John chapter 5, notice that at verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven. So the, there are three heavenly witnesses, right? Mm -hmm. The heavenly witnesses are the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. But the scripture all of a sudden starts to jump to verse 8. Why? Because it wants to point out witnesses on earth now. The three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Why, if you want to, so think about this. If you actually want to take the three er earthly witnesses, witnesses, that means evidences, the three earthly witnesses, and try to find which substance of these three er earthly witnesses that would match best with the three heavenly witnesses. So let's review in case it, it was a little deep and you got lost. So first of all, there are heavenly witnesses, right? 
The heavenly witnesses are as follow. The Holy Spirit. See these three levels here? Watch this now. There's the Spirit here. There's the water here. And then there's the blood. If we're going to find which part of the tri Trinity or which part of the heavenly witness it would match best. Let's go from easiest to difficult. Spirit is pretty simple. We can match that with God, the Holy Spirit. So blood, spirit, water. All right. So we can match that with God, the Holy Spirit. So that's pretty simple enough. If we take blood, that would match best with Jesus Christ. Because the Bible, 1 John, at context, mentioned about Jesus Christ, where it puts special significance about the blood when Jesus Christ came down in human form. So we put God the Son here. Then water, then maybe, maybe, let me just say maybe, it can go with Father then. But let's think about one by one now. Mankind was created in the image of God, and then when we sinned, obviously they lost it, then we regained it through Jesus Christ. But we can all agree that when God created mankind, he created him with uh, three parts that's supposed to reflect about God himself. And that is what? Body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. And we see that in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, where basically mankind is undoubtedly created where they're supposed to, when they were created and made with their three parts, it was supposed to reflect God himself. That's why he made us very, very special. Taking account with that one, think about the other one now. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Go to Romans 1, 20. What about his creation then? What about his creation? You got to realize this. When, when you're created and everything in creation itself is created, it's supposed to be a handprint of God himself. Every work that you see from an intelligent designer, you can tell when you pay attention to the details of their creation that it's re representing a specific designer and author. Like when you look at Honda cars, when you look at paintings, you can tell when you look at the details and the styles, the handiwork of which one would reflect and represent the designer. So creation, if you study science, there's no doubt about it when you study creation itself. It's a handprint of an intelligent designer, not random chance of evolution. That's why you can easily become a safe Christian, not an evolutionist. But look at Romans 1.20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and what? Godhead, the Trinity, the Trinity. If you study basic doctrines on the Trinity, you have learned that the evidence of the Trinity is through creation itself. And they would give several examples about that. But have you ever thought about one example of his creation? One example of his creation, if we take all matter, if we take all matter of creation itself, look at this one now. It comes through three different stages. It comes through something solid, like a body does, like Jesus Christ came down with. It comes down, uh, it goes through the state of what? It goes through the state of gas or air. And what does spirit pneuma mean? It is air and gas itself. That's why there's pneumatics. But then you put that with water, with the Father as well. But, but, now let's keep building up one by one when we connect all the dots here. Let's keep connecting the dots. And this thing, there might be something to this then. Look at Psalms chapter 42 then. Psalms chapter 42. So it's easy to see that blood and physical solid, yeah, we can match that with the sun. And then we can see how, we can see also that spirit or gas or air match with the Holy Spirit, Numa. But also, then it brings up to this question, is there a soul that, and water that can match with the Father God himself? Or that the soul matches with water? Look at these verses. This is pretty interesting. Look at Psalms chapter 42. 
and we'll read verse 1. Look at the connections here. Now, when they talk about God in the Old Testament, you know what they were referring to, the Father that time. So look at this about the Father. Psalms 42.1. As a heart panteth after the water brooks, so, my, so panteth my soul after who? The, O oh God, the Father, like water. Oh, let's look at another one. Psalms chapter 63, verse 1. Psalms chapter 63, verse 1. Maybe there might be something to this. Just maybe. Psalms chapter 63, verse 1. The Bible says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where what? No water is. That's how much they crave after the Father God, as if you're craving after water. Look at another one over here. Psalms chapter 69, verse 1. Psalms chapter 69. Verse 1. Look at the connection. Did you look at, remember the past two passages in Psalms where soul is mentioned there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now look at this one. Psalm 69, 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. So this is just a question. This is not a 100% truth or fact, but these are questions then. If this can make sense, that soul will match with water, could our soul be likened, be likened, I didn't say is, but could it be likened to a watery substance? Like the spirit, which is undoubtable in the Bible, John chapter 3, is likened, likened to air and wind, an airy substance? Could that be why souls can go to the lake, lake of fire, or souls can go through the sea, sea of glass, souls can go through the sea of glass, in heaven. All right. Uh, open up Pandora's box. Revelation 13, verse 16. Revelation 13, verse 16. Revelation 13, 16. Now let's talk about the tribulation, how blood will operate. Now this is very important to understand the tribulation. When they take the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a very different operation from us. That's why dispensationalism is so important. And if you believe in that, all the other doctrines is going to make sense so much. We are Bible-believing dispensationalists. Look at Revelation 13, verse 16. So we know in the tribulation, what does the devil do? He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So the devil places a mark in their right hand or forehead. But did you ever thought about this? Why would he do a mark system? At the beginning, he kept attacking the blood. He always wants to disgrace the blood. So think about it. If he did this in the past times, don't you think that you'd bet you he'd do it at this time too? Yeah. Well, think about this. Whether the mark, if you think that it's going to be on the surface like a permanent uh, mark, or if it's going to be some kind of chip or something technological-wise inside the hand, it doesn't change the fact, it doesn't change the fact that when, whether you have a permanent mark on or in the hand, you have to uh, dabble with blood. You have to play with blood. Tattoos, that's why they keep pricking, pricking, and then blood has to come out. Why? Because you have to have something permanent. You have to put some kind of, I don't know, maybe, just maybe a vaccine or something like that yeah. one day. Maybe, maybe one day vaccine or an RFID chip or some kind of computer system or something. They have to, it messes with your blood when it goes inside. So notice right over here, Satan dabbles with blood again. But this is physically. So because this is something where they're dabbling with blood, think about it. Tribulation salvation then is undoubtedly different from church age salvation. Because they have to, they have to, they have to get rid of this. They have to reject this. That's a totally different salvation from us back then. That's right. Uh-oh. Is it off? No. I, okay. It's still recording and they can hear my voice? Uh, if they can't, then I can't I teach. Time. That I can't teach. Yeah. It was never recording the archive? No, no, no. It just went out. Oh, okay. It just popped off of. Wow. That's weird. Wow. Okay. Well, I mentioned about the devil attacking, so. 
Maybe there's something to it. I don't know. But let's look at Revelation chapter 7 then. Revelation chapter 7. <laughs> Revelation chapter 7. And then I want you to go to Jude 23. We're going to go to Revelation 7 and Jude 23. Live stream contains it though, right? The volume or no? Live stream, yeah, live stream is all good. You're still okay, then I'm going to continue then, okay? okay? Jude 23 and Revelation 7. That's why look at this. Look at this. Tribulation saints, they cannot get saved by the blood of Christ the same way we do. They have to resist the mark or spot, which is practically self-washing in the blood of Christ. Why? Because they have to self-wash the mark off. Now look at this. Look at this. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. Look at the wording here in your King James Bible. 714. I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. He said to me. Oh. Battery's gone then. Or is it has it been off? Yeah, battery's off. Okay. Yeah, no, it just went out. I had it. I was this is live time. stream? Alright then. So go ahead. Alright, so we're going to look. Wow, this is going to be a problem. I'm going to have fun editing this. Revelation chapter 7, and then we'll read verse 14. I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have what? Washed their robes, and made them white in the what? Blood of the Lamb. Notice over here that the tribulation saints, they have to wash themselves. They have to do the washing in the blood. Why? Because they have to wash themselves in the blood to avoid stains of marks or spots. Jude 23. Jude 23. Jude is a tribulation epistle, right? Now look what happens at the tribulation. Jude 23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the what? They have to wash in the blood of the lamb, right? Yeah. Their robes, the, the garment spotted by the flesh. Look at that. So the tribulation saints, matching with Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, their washing is different from our salvation when we received our washing. The Lord Jesus Christ does the washing for us. Over here, they have to wash themselves in the blood of the Lamb to avoid that spot, that mark, spot mark. You see that? So that's obviously works, not just faith alone, especially Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 and verse 17. You can go over there and look at that in your spare time. But see, they're trying to resist the persecution of the Antichrist and the mark. And the Bible calls that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and word of testimony. And then the later verse says that it's referring to keep the commandments of God and it's referring to also faith. So you see that? So Revelation 12, verse 11 and 17, connects that with the faith and work system, not just faith alone. Now let's close it off with Revelation 22 and Ezekiel 47. Let's close it off with Revelation 22 and Ezekiel 47. After this, we will have Q&A after a little bit of prayer meeting. So we'll have prayer meeting and then we'll have Q&A. So if you can save up your questions then it can contribute to keeping the service going. So if you can have a question prepared and ready. So let's go to Ezekiel 47 and Revelation chapter 22. Think about this. Just like in the beginning this dispensation, they had no blood issue. Blood was not involved over here. It's just a pure water system. Then in eternity is going to match the same way with the pure water water system and that also there is no blood necessary or required for salvation that time during eternity it's repeating look at revelation chapter 22 verse 2 the bible says in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Look at this. A totally different tree now compared to back then. 
It is the tree of life. And notice that if you keep reading Revelation 22, it's the river. It's called also water of life. And what did the Bible say? The Spirit's inviting you to take the water of life freely. If you keep reading later down. Mm -mm. Now, that, now you get life from water, water of life. But let's look at Ezekiel 47. So this map, the eternal dispensation matches with the beginning dispensation. But what about mankind here? Isn't the millennium going to be the same as the Bible says, like the Garden of Eden? Like Adam? So in the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ, you will notice that what happens is in the millennium, blood is not required for salvation. And the water of life instead shows up in the millennium. So matching the same way again. Where it goes from blue, from water, to red, it goes from red to water. Why? Because God has to clean off the wicked at the judgment of nations. He's going to take some time doing that. And then eventually it's going to be a pure system again. Look at the book of Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 12. Ezekiel 47, verse 12. This is not to say there is absolute. So I don't want there to be a misunderstanding. This is not to say that there is absolutely no blood during eternity or the millennium. I don't want there to be a misunderstanding. Because in the millennium, they have to do animal sacrifices. But see, blood is not required for salvation. It's used as worship to honor God. That's what it's used for. Also, the people are going to have to repopulate. So they're going to do that during the millennium and eternity. But that's a whole other doctrine and story. The point is over here is that blood is not required. That's the point. Blood is not required for salvation. And it, instead, what becomes the essential factor, the attention factor again, is water again, a pure water system. Look at Ezekiel 47. Look how it matched with Revelation 22. But this is during the millennium. The Jerusalem temple in the millennium. Look how it matches with Revelation 22 to a T. Verse 12. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaves shall not fade. Uh, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. So notice that God has a pure water system again at the millennium, just like he did during eternity. This is where we, you get your uh, amazing doctrine, both basic, both practical and applicable in your current Christian walk, as well as intensely deep and interesting about the doctrine concerning the blood of God and devils. I hope that it has been a blessing to you. And in your daily Bible reading, you can see something now. You'll see something significant. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers and opened our greater knowledge and understanding as we read that book, especially the importance about the blood and how you took blood significantly. And I pray that you'll bless the next hours as we do our, as we do our prayer meeting and Q&A and our fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.